Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB, wherever you stream your video content and wherever you, uh, you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you consuming the show. And guys, I have, uh, as, as we continue to evolve as Zoom-based creatures um, in today's world, uh, step in the right direction for me. I was sent a, 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 a visual tutorial by somebody that the uh, Yeti microphone is supposed to be straight up and down. It is not, you don't talk into the top of it like you do other microphones. It's supposed to be just straight up and down like this. So I'm finally uh, applying my Yeti microphone correctly for the first time. So I'm sure that's going to make all the audio quality difference in the world for you guys. We've got Allie Trost and Carter Augustine with us as always. Allie, how are you? I like the, the, the a rainbow SKC shirt. I've got the, um, the actual jersey the from the 2000 cup which is going to be a big theme for today's show and carter you've got a rainbow kit on as well how's everybody doing so far today doing well it's funny i nate you've got all the gizmos and gadgets carter and i are just screaming into the void of our apartment right now uh, <laughs> hoping that the sound picks up with our laptops <laughs> some of us just take it more seriously you know that, that sh- <laughs> no, this is how bad I am at technology. So for Christmas, my dad, bless his heart, got me some AirPods. I was like, eh, I don't know if I need them. He's like, I don't know, like just your brothers want them. Like just that's like the gift to everybody. I love them. I love these things, but I have for the life of me cannot figure out how to connect them to my laptop. I have tried <laughs> everything. So unless I'm doing it on my phone, I just like then I've got the cord and it looks all whatever. So I'll figure it out at some point by the time this quarantine is over. Yeah, I'm uh, glad to hear you clearly, Nate. Um, I'm happy for you. Uh, and, yeah, doing well. Hope you, hope you guys had a good Memorial weekend. Did have a good Memorial Day weekend. I'll, I'll lay out the, uh, the, the menu real quick, and we'll talk about a couple of things before we take a break because we've got a special guest, and we're going to spend a lot of time with our special guest today, Tony Miola, is going to join us because coming up on Saturday at 7 o'clock and then at 9 o'clock on Fox Sports Kansas City, we are going to re-air the 2000 MLS Cup Final. Tony Miola was the star of that game, making save after save against a star-studded Chicago Fire team. I think, by the way, during our interview with Tony, I might have accidentally said D.C. United because the game was in Washington, D.C., and watching back the game, in my head, it just I keep thinking D.C. United. But Chicago was an incredible team at that time, the best attacking team in MLS. Uh, the Wizards were the best defensive team in MLS. An epic final, a great game. You're going to want to go back and watch that. And we're going to watch that one with Peter and Kerry. Uh, so awesome. that is going to be something that you'll want to make sure that you check out with the rest of us um, on Saturday night at 7 and 9 o'clock. Uh, and we're going to talk with Tony Miola about that. So that's coming up. I'll lay down the, uh, the menu for what's coming up over the uh, course of this week as well. On Thursday, we got the classic match between Sporting Kansas City and the Philadelphia Union from April 5th of 2015. And uh, we've also, tomorrow on Wednesday, got For the Cheers presented by Michelob Ultra featuring a, uh, a certain Carter Augustine with Jacob Peterson. Carter, why don't you uh, give us a little taste of what we can expect from that coming up? Um, it was a good one. Best one yet, I would argue. Shout out to, to Jacob Peterson, the answer. And he gives his, uh, his five-a-side team of, of players he played with throughout his career. And obviously, he had such a, a long uh, career in MLS and also um, started out in Bradenton. So he's played with uh, a number of fantastic players. And he actually had a lot of fun with that. And it was uh, – he's got – He's got some good teams. Uh, he went three deep, so he's uh, he had some some tough questions that he had to to ask himself in, in that team. It was really fun. Yeah, so so make sure everybody checks that out on Wednesday at six o'clock for the Cheers, presented by Michelob Ultra. All right, guys, uh, latest from soccer world before we get into the interview with Tony Miola. First off, on the uh, on the 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 round of negotiations taking place between Major League Soccer and the Major League. Uh, Players Association as we try to get ramped up to this. Look, there have been leaks. Apparently, there have been emails about leaks. Apparently, there have been leaks about the emails about the leaks and all of that. I don't know about you guys. I can't get enough of just reading the content of what's it going to look like. Is this going to happen? None of us really know yet. But my biggest takeaway to this point is 
apparently, according to all these stories, you had the owners put together a plan and a proposal. The players came back with a counter proposal. The owners have already made then a counter to that counter proposal. That tells me that they're working, that they're, they're negotiating. They're not just sitting there ignoring one another and saying, nope, it's our way or, or you take a hike. No, it's our way or you take a hike. To me, if that's the tone of this, it makes me very optimistic that the two sides will be able to work this out and we can get back to what we all want, which is hopefully a great soccer competition. What do you guys think of what's happened over the past week? Yeah, I mean, I think it shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that there would be a back and forth, right? I mean, there's going to be some negotiation in this process. It's not like, here's our first proposal, boom, let's go. That looks perfect and we're ready to play. Um, I think what we've seen, again, across not just soccer, but every single league trying to return to play, there's a lot of unknown. This is unusual. People are trying to figure out from a financial standpoint how to make it work, from how to make it work rather from a health and safety standpoint how to make it work. There's a lot of moving parts. The one thing that shouldn't come as a surprise to uh, Don Garber is that there would be leaks with all of this, right? That's what we <laughs> see whenever there is a negotiation or whenever there's big news happening, memos going out left and right. Those are going to get in the hands of reporters. Uh, that's just how this thing works, and it should be a good sign that that's you know being reported on because it's keeping people in the know. So I, I thought it, the, the statement from Don Garber, uh, I was a little shocked by just because I don't think, I didn't find it too surprising that those uh, documents made it out. Carter, I don't know what you think. Um, wondering how our friend Paul Tenorio is, and others are at The Athletic are, are doing now, but uh, they obviously broke the story last week. And yeah. um, like you said, it, it is of, of great interest to everyone in the soccer world. So you can see why they did it. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, Nay. I'm buoyed by the fact that there seems to be some back and forth happening. Um, and then we're seeing uh, a little more concrete stuff coming out of Spain and England as well as to maybe when they could uh, perhaps resume. Um, so it, it seems to be trending in the right direction. And, you know, we saw some, some big crowds over Memorial Weekend. So I think we're still going to maybe wait and see uh, what happens there, but um, hopefully, hopefully it, it's, it, it is going to end up where it's trending towards and that's uh, resuming some soccer here. Um, maybe not super soon, but hopefully soon. Well, we, we know one positive from those huge crowds uh, over Memorial Day weekend is that you know, it leads to tweets by Ali Trost that go yeah. viral. Over 10,000 likes from a funny tweet from Ali Trost through the course of this, uh, this, the Lake of the Ozarks, you know, generating so much controversy. <laughs> I never thought that like my most, I guess this is the first time I've gone viral, which is hilarious because viral, haha, virus, haha. Yep. During yep. Pandemic. But I was just stating the obvious. I saw that video and I was like, oh God, like, <laughs> well, I'm with, I think this? that's why it went viral because everybody's yeah. like, that's right. I don't want to be in that pool. I don't get pandemic or not there's some stuff going on in that pool that I just don't want to be mixing in with, you know? If you get in that pool and you have like a hangnail, you're getting your arm amputated. Like <laughs> <laughs> You're going to come home, go to bed, wake up, and your entire hand is black. Like, I don't know what is going on <laughs> there, but yeah. not for me, not for me. Yeah, it does. Bacteria, virus, there's just, there's too many things happening in that pool and we don't, we need, we don't need to go there. So I'm glad that we're all safe from that situation. Um, the other situation from the weekend that, 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 that generated a lot of conversation, and again, this broadcast nerdness of us, but also soccer fan nerdness of us, at Mines, they piped in crowd noise. And we're going to hear from Tony Miola. He actually was some good information about, I thought they were piping it in through the stadium, um, which apparently they're not. I personally would be in favor of that because I think it actually might lift the level of the players a little bit as well to make them feel like they're in uh, a crowded arena. And I would have been against this going in, guys. And I was against it going in. I thought, no, I want to hear the Nat sounds. Let's explore with hearing the players. And it, all it took for me was one weekend of listening to the Bundesliga and the echoes in the empty stadium to feel like, man, I think I want some crowd noise and I thought it sounded better. I thought it sounded better as a broadcast. I think it would sound better to the players themselves. And I was, uh, I was spending some time thinking about it this weekend as well. We have it in FIFA, right? Like there's, there's crowd noise in FIFA. If you take a shot when you're playing FIFA, you know, on, on your video game system, 
and a shot sails over the bar, the crowd, oh, you know, it, it reacts. If we can pull it off in a video game, I don't really see why we can't pull it off in a, in a game on the field. That's my two cents. Now I'll, open up, I'll start with you, Carter. You're maybe sometimes more of a purist, really, than I am about a lot of these things. What did you think of it? No, I think it did help the broadcast for sure. And, um, yeah, we'll hear, hear some from Tony Miola about it. Uh, you have talked about the fact that uh, calling games from tube is pretty difficult. Um, and the fact that if you can get the crowd in your ears, it can raise your, your level while you're, while you're calling the game. And um, I think we saw that in that game. Um, FIFA has got some algorithms that I think will be a little difficult to replicate in, in, this, <laughs> in this particular instance. And we again talked about uh, being that audio guy that would have to do that would be the worst job imaginable for me. Um, but there are some capable people out there that, that do audio and they could do that. Um, I, I don't know. I pumping it into the stadium. I, I think we've said this before. This is, these are games that matter. They shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do that to, to yeah. increase the, the play of the players on the field. Um, as far as the broadcasters go, I agree. I, I think it helps. And so I'm curious to see if they'll do it a little bit more. I don't think it needs to be in the stadium, but um, maybe they'll try it out. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, what I don't necessarily think it needs to be in the stadium either, but I'm also in the camp of if it helps in any way, and this is a strange time for players who might be dealing with other things that are hard to leave off the field, uh, given the fact that we're in a, a health pandemic, but I think for the broadcast, it helps so much, especially when you just consider all the different camera angles. There are a couple of times where if the shot was zoomed in enough where you hear the, you hear the noise and you don't see the stands and it felt, not that it, it needs to be normal by any means, but it, it just helped from a viewing standpoint. And I think you could tell how, how it helped the broadcasters as well. So I think that that's something uh, that should stick with each and every single broadcast going forward. But they, I mean, I, it makes me think of like NFL and there are practices where you hear teams before a big game, they'll pump in the arrowhead sound noise. If it's like, you know, an opposing team coming to arrowhead and getting ready. Sometimes it's just good to have that uh, replicate that kind of energy uh, for a team and whether that, you know, ups their play or helps them mentally lock in. Sometimes it's just that extra step in the preparation process that that gets things going so maybe it's not you know crowd noise in the actual game but maybe they've got something to help simulate them beforehand yeah, I think we're all for it on some level just working it out and I think that in terms of the guy that's got to sit there and push buttons to change the crowd I think you keep it simple to me shots that happen you hit that button that makes the crowd, ooh, that type of thing and when they score, the crowd goes wild, maybe. I don't think you need to get into booing the referees and apparently maybe booing the, the, the players when, when they lose. I think you could stay away from all that and still have the benefits, but uh, we'll see where it goes. Let's go ahead and take a break. We're going to have Tony Mueller, a long-form interview. We're going to talk about all the current-day stuff, Bundesliga, MLS return to play, and we'll relive that 2000 MLS Cup final with one of the all-time greats, Tony Miola, right after this on the Sporting Kansas City Show. And we're back on the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB, wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you stream your content. And one of the things that's been maybe a positive out of this whole pandemic is how easy it's been for us to actually connect face-to-face, -face, so to speak, with some of our good buddies. And, and one of them is with us now um, because, boy, there's a connection here to one of the great players in franchise history, but also a guy who was a, a consistent part of my morning show, guys, with Stephen St. John. He used to do a show with Stephen St. John before Stephen and I even worked together. Then for a while there, when you were living in Kansas City, Tony, you were coming on with us on a weekly basis on the morning show, too. We've got – as uh, as his teammates used to call him, Big Tones, Tony Miola uh, on the show right now. How are you, man? I'm doing well. Hopefully you guys are uh, doing well and getting through this this odd time that we're all living in right now. But I'm glad uh, to see all the faces, and, uh, and we'll chat a little bit about what happened a few years back. We will. We, we are we, – the, the impetus for having Tony on today – is because we've been doing these replays of classic games with player commentary. And I got to be honest, the one out of all of the ones we've done that I'm most excited about is the one we've got coming up this weekend 
the 2000 MLS Cup final. We've got Kerry Zavagnin and Peter Vermees doing the commentary with me on this one. And uh, just trust me, we've already taped it. People are going to want to watch that because you know Kerry and, and Peter – and I'm going to have Tony tell some stories about those guys here in a minute. <laughs> Tony was the star of the show, by the way, in that game. And we talked a lot about you, Tony, when we went back and watched it. So we're going to get to that in a minute. But before we go back to reliving that, that year and, and that game with you, Tony, let's, let's get a temperature check on you, metaphorically speaking, right now. Um, how are things for you in Florida? What's, uh, how are you uh, holding things together right now through the course of these, uh, these weird times? Yeah, well, family's doing well. Thanks for asking. Um, I can tell you, and I, if you ask me for like the next two months, it's 85 and sunny with a chance of thunderstorms where I live every day. <laughs> and that's that's kind of where I'm at. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, we've been really fortunate. My parents are still uh, up north. My mother-in-law is still up north in New Jersey, and uh, they're doing fine, hanging in there. Um, and I, I try and tell everyone as much as I I when I go to put my head down on the pillow at night, it's I'm, I'm going stir crazy, but I tell everyone, well, we're one day closer uh, to whenever the end is to this thing. So uh, that's my positive message to people for the day. Hopefully in a, in a couple of weeks, I'll be, uh, I'll be uh, believing it myself, if you will. Well, you mentioned a little bit about uh, the math being a lot harder than you remember. <laughs> I guess been the biggest challenge with, I know you said all your kids are home parenting and quarantine. I know it's been a big, change for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but when, when they first said, you know, my, so my uh, youngest is a just finishing uh, this week, his junior year of high school. And um, when they said, Oh, when, parents, you'll have to get out, you have to get them online and do all this stuff. And I'm not great with technology as anyone who listens to my radio show knows. Um, and uh, you know, I looked at the math. He's like, yeah, can you help me for one second? I looked at him like, I mean, this is, this is like, uh, it, this is completely different from what I was doing in school. And I know I've heard that from so many parents. <laughs> so I have a much better, a much bigger appreciation uh, for teachers. And I already had a great admiration for, uh, for teachers and what they do, but man, what no, just not an easy job. And, and you know what, credit to the kids too, because when th there are some kids that are, are disciplined enough to just turn on a computer and feel like they're in class and wake up at eight o'clock in the morning and see the teacher on the screen. And it's, it's normal in some ways, you know, at least they get there for some kids. It's really difficult. Um, you know, my, my youngest, it's not, uh, it's not ideal for him not to, not to be in the class. And so credit to the kids that have had to sort of change their whole life and the way they do it and get through it. Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, one positive out of all this is, people like teachers might get a little bit more appreciation uh, down the line. Okay. Hopefully that comes out of it. Uh, I, I feel, Tony, one of the things that we've been asking everyone, it seems kind of uh, cliche now, but have you been watching anything to, to keep you busy uh, throughout this time, reading it? Um, I never was a Netflix fan. I'm going to show you one of my rundowns from yesterday here. And in the middle, you can see there's some blue. I, I don't know if you can see that, but I need some glasses. Let, let's see what I, I've gone through. I've done Breaking Bad, which I, never, I know I, I'm way behind. I've done all three seasons of uh, Ozark. I've done all of Peaky Blinders. I've done The Outer Banks, believe it or not. I've done Tiger King, by the way. If you didn't do Tiger King, there's, you know. And then all of the soccer shows, the Brazil Take Us Home, the Boca Juniors, the Leeds United, the Concrete Football, the All or Nothing Man City. I can go on and on in this wow. section. I never – until this pandemic watch Netflix really in my life ever. I may have seen something on it, but I wouldn't call myself like a Netflix uh, person where I go on the weekend. If I, if I ever had time on the weekend after watching probably EPL and Bundesliga and then waiting at night and watching MLS and then doing basically the same thing on Sunday, but adding La Liga and Serie A in, um, if I ever had time at night, I was probably going back and watching some of the games that I missed, you know? So, but th that has all changed obviously for me. I'm yeah, so so the the, <laughs> um, the Bundesliga itself. We're, we're now we're taping this right before uh, Der Klassiker between uh, Dortmund and, and Bayern, but we've got a couple weekends in. What have you thought of our first glimpse of soccer coming back? These ghost stadiums. We we saw them experiment with the crowd noise and the minds match over yeah. the weekend. What did you think so far of, of what we've seen? What are your biggest takeaways? Well, from a playing standpoint, I thought some teams were really good. 
Um, and Schalke has been poor. There's been some poor performances as well, which I suppose you expect. Uh, maybe Schalke we look at under a different lens these days because Weston McKinney's there, and it's kind of been um, – Schalke has been sort of that team that we're waiting to get into. You know, poor season last year on a roller coaster right now. Uh, my old teammate is the manager there, David Wagner. I played with him in the national team, and uh, so I kind of have this soft spot for wanting to see him do well. But – um, I, I thought overall the play has been a lot better than I thought it was. And, and you know, you get to MLS and you talk about the, the start coming sometime here in the new, near future, and you keep hearing the word innovative, right, from Don Garber, the commissioner. And um, I, I go, you mentioned the crowd noise. I was actually a fan uh, of it. I, some mm-hmm. weren't. I thought it helped. And, and we, we, uh, we sent a message yesterday to uh, Phil Bonney, who's one of the guys that you're hearing on the World Feed, who we have on our show all the time. And he said they actually, because we were unsure. So the, the crowd noise was not pumped into the stadium. So the, the players in the stadium didn't hear it, but we heard it at home. But what we were unsure of, whether it was pumped into the announcer's ears. And it was pumped into their ears. And he said it helped tremendously in calling the game. Like I call, I work for CONCACAF, so I call CONCACAF games. And, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night games where you got like a couple thousand people. We've had some closed door games. And it's like 1130 at night on the East Coast. And you're calling your second game of the night. And you guys know you work in this business. And you're, you're like, you're, you don't want to make up energy, you know, but you feel like you have to make up some energy. So you're kind of caught in the middle there. Do I yell at this point? Do I raise my voice? By the way, can I raise my voice? Cause it's 1130 and I've just called my second game of the night, you know, so you, all these things, but he said the, the, uh, the crowd noise pumped into his ear really, really helped the energy. And I thought, I don't know if you guys, you're in the business, obviously. I don't know if you guys thought it was funny, there's actually a guy there that has to feel the emotion of the game. At the end of that Mines game, he actually piped in some boos when his team flubbed an opportunity. And I thought to myself, that takes a lot. You know, you're, you're really running the risk because you're, you're trying to go with the ebbs and the flows. And you, so it's not just like random noise pumped in. It's kind of emotional. And, and the emotion is supposed to match the game. And I thought that was pretty cool. But I'd hate to have that job. And if anyone – if that guy gets on Twitter, for sure, forget it. Uh, there'll be <laughs> slaughter in that guy. <laughs> Delicate dance, for sure. I mean, we talked about the struggle of, like, pressing the right button or what if you mess up and you're all of a sudden pumping in the wrong reaction to what just happened. But something else that was interesting, my team, which is Munchen Gladbach, had the cutout fans. Did you think that was creepy or cool? What was, what was- I thought it was I thought it was pretty cool. And now they're they're taking it one step further where they're actually gonna have uh those the uh signage with live fans and they're gonna zoom them in. So you're gonna get some emotion. Look, I I suppose, Ali, we gotta we we have to almost be open to everything, right? And open to whatever you know, pe- people are just. If you can imagine, um, and you're in the you're in their office in Munchen Gladbach, and they're saying we need some energy. How do we do it? Now you come up with a million ideas, and they're picking one to try and you know they're trying to keep the fans involved. They're trying to. I, I thought the cutouts were a great idea, and they they I guess they that money was donated to charity. Um, can they do that? Would they have like thirteen thousand? Can they do a stadium of? 30 something I don't know if they can but um, it's at least visually as it goes by it looks a little bit better but yeah I I suppose in a lot of ways this this has um, taken everyone back to square one every player that is going to training in the EPL or the Bundesliga or La Liga everyone at some point has played in front of nobody has taken their own gear home to wash it uh, and had to go to training the next day. And yeah, we're all spoiled when you get to that level because all of this stuff is done. So maybe we'll just kind of rethink um, the, sort of how lucky um, we are. I, I know from my standpoint now, and, and I, I'm sure you guys feel the same way, the, it's an honor to be able to call games and to be able to work on the radio and be able to have people listen to you. Whether they agree with you or not is a completely different story, but it's an honor to be able to do that. I, I will never take it for granted being in a, in a booth and calling a game and, and having that sort of that, that for me is, is now the high in life. You know, that's like it, this, my sporting, my sporting drug is being in there and feeling the energy. I can't play anymore, obviously, but um, you know, that I'll never take it for granted. Uh, while we're still in the Bundesliga, I wanted to ask about David Wagner since you brought him up. Um, I feel like 
I just don't really know that much about him, despite him being a, a U.S. international. Um, and then he makes this meteoric rise with Huddersfield, and now he's at Schalke. Did you see him becoming a manager? And just maybe uh, what was he like as a player? And, and how do you see him as a coach now? Um, well, he was always kind of a quieter player. He wasn't, he wasn't a rah-rah guy. Um, and we played only a short period of time together on the national team, but we've kind of always kept in touch. I've had him on our show as he was kind of coming through the ranks. And we had him on our show when he was at Huddersfield Town and gets them through promotion. And I'm not surprised that he's a manager. He, he, he was one of those guys that could never – get away just physically, right? So he had to be a cerebral player. You mentioned Kerry Zavagnin, right? I mean, much like Kerry Zavagnin, who, who was such a great player, and we talk about this, this 2000 Cup final, that whole season, probably the most unsung guy um, in the entire league. Uh, and maybe one of the most unsung guys all time in our league. I, I haven't seen the final uh, – since 2000 right I haven't seen it since 2000 since we since uh, I was on the field I can just remember and he'd probably tell you better than me um, how much running that guy did and I don't Mm -hmm. know how much how much he touched the ball in the game but you take him out of the game and we don't win the game right we just don't we we, we're not in that position during the season now Peter was a different story because he was kind of anchoring everything we were playing with three in the back which was unusual uh we were lucky because we had Klein on one side and Henderson on the other side and I think they're still running those two guys you know they're, they're still running up and down flanks all the time so we were really lucky in the way that team was set up so P- Peter had a little more and he's a little more vocal in general as you guys know and, and he was like that as a player but so w- when I think about David Wagner it's kind of cutting that same mold as carries a Wagner you know and that kind of player I'm not surprised carries a coach I'm not surprised that players enjoy playing for Kerry um, I'm not surprised that he's had success uh, with Peter in, in Kansas City uh, none, none of uh, either of their two uh, bits of success really surprises me at all all right let's jump into that that 2000 cup final then Tony because I got to be honest, it was a thrill for me to go because I hadn't watched that game back probably since 2000 myself. That was 20 years ago, you know, and, and especially if you're, if you're not a person that played in it, your memory kind of fades and, and so much happens in life since then. And let's be honest, there's going to be a lot of our audience that probably has never seen it. Um, and, and so what a thrill it was to go back and look at that. If you are a fan of MLS or just soccer today, the first thing that stood out to me was – the cast of characters that participated in that game and where they are now. I mean, obviously, you yourself, one of the top voices of soccer in this entire, you know, continent, let alone in this country. Um, you talked about Klein and Henderson. These guys are front office guys at two of the, two of the most successful franchises in MLS. Peter and Kerry, uh, same situation there. You look on the other – and, and Precky, you know, has been a head coach at the MLS yeah. level and still there – you look on the other side, you, um, Jesse Marsh, you know, who's won a supporter shield and is now doing groundbreaking things as an American manager in Europe. Chris Armas, who followed him up. Uh, uh, Carlos Bocanegra. I mean, like, Bob Bradley was the head coach of that D.C. United team. When well, you, you, got, you keep in mind, you got C.J. Brown, who also has been an, an assistant for years. You got Ante Razov, who's an assistant. I'm trying to think off the top of my head with LAFC with Bob. Um, you got Zach Thornton, who's been an assistant and a goalkeeper coach, I don't know, probably, I'm going to guess, 10 or 12 years now. Um, and the list, Peter Novak, who we know yeah. was at Philly. Uh, Lubas Kubek, who was at a World Cup with Jurgen Klinsmann. And, and I, the list goes on and on in that group. I'm glad you mentioned that part of it, Nate, because there there's some uh, some really important uh, – okay, the game is one thing, and, and 2000 was special in Kansas City, but there's there's – it's important that we continue to use the guys that, that built the sport and those guys were there and they're all helping it to build in, in very different ways, but all equally as important in what they're doing. Well, and, and it, a couple of things that struck me about that is just, okay, when you get to a point of a championship game, you're going to see a lot of guys that, that will go on to continue to do great things because they're, they're great. That's why they're in a championship game. But I think we spend so much time, maybe rightfully so, talking about the improvements of the league over the last five years, ten years, whatever, and how how the leaps and bounds that the league has made. But I tell you what, you go back in 2000, 
the league was so much smaller. The concentration of great players was kind of what stood out to me too. It was like, they look like two all-star teams out there in many ways. And what I thought was crazy is you guys were kind of considered the unwanted. Everybody had kind of been bounced around. <laughs> but look at how many great players were on both teams because there weren't as many teams in the league at that time. Yeah, I can't imagine what some of the guys uh, would be worth to, in this day and age in the league. You know, what, what, what would you pay for a center back? And I'm talking about Peter Vermes, who organizes everything, right? How many of those do we have in the league right now that, that are that vocal and are that confident in organizing? What would you pay for a Miklos Molnar, who I think we won like eight or nine one-nil games that year, and he scored seven of the goals um, in that point. He, he just cared about scoring in big moments. What would you pay for, you know, the two Chris's on either side that are, uh, are there, there's no more box there. There's no more box to box guys in world football anymore. It's just, it's just too much work to do. Those guys would have come as close to working that way as anyone that you, you would see in the game. I mean, and let's go the other side of the, the other side of the coin, like, what would Chris Armis be worth uh, as a number six right now in this league? And, uh, you know, and, and I get it's a different era, but I'm just trying to make a point that there was some really uh, – don't, don't get – I don't want anyone – I don't want this to get masked by the fact that it was 2000, right? There was really, really good players. And those mm -hmm. are players for me that can still compete in any era that we've had uh, in Major League Soccer so far. Tony, I want to touch on something that you said about the organization factor with working with Peter Vermees. And that was one thing that stood out to me. I've watched a lot of these games back now, especially the, uh, the conference final series against LA and just the command that you and Peter had of the entire team just from that backfield. What was it like working with Peter in that way? And how strong of a connection did the two of you have in order to lead the team in the way that you did oftentimes through the organization? Yeah, we, Ali, we talked about it every day. Um, and, and one thing sticks out for me from Peter that season. I told this story not too long ago. It's funny that, that you're asking. Was game one. Uh, we were at home against Chicago. So we started and ended with Chicago. And they also ended our 13-game uh, start at the season of an unbeaten streak. I think it was game 14 that we lost in Chicago. It might be 13. I could be one off. But anyway, we, we win opening night, and, and this is – we used to call ourselves the misfits, right, as Nate said. No, no one wanted us. We had all got traded to Kansas City, and it was like <laughs> the black hole at the time, you know, and you go to Kansas City, and you're like, oh, man, is this like the end now, you know? <laughs> but uh, it was the beginning of something great, and we didn't know it. Um, and, and we came in, and we won 4-3. It was an exciting game. Goalkeeper uh, Sutton was named from Chicago, gave us a, a, a gift to make it 4-2. Then Ante Razov, I believe, scores, makes it 4-3. And Peter came in, and everybody is excited. And, you know, we win opening night. That's what you want to do. We were so poor the year before. Chicago was so much, so far ahead of us the year before. And Peter was not happy. And he let the entire locker room know that he was not happy that we gave up three goals. And, and you know, I, I – there were there were some things said that I probably can't say and and but it woke us up and it said you know what we're we're better than this we're better than giving up three goals um, in a game here and it, I think it was just a it was just a message it was the right message and uh, and again it goes back to why he's probably had success it was the right message at the right time I tell you it's the first game of the season and some people might go what's well, kind of odd you you're yelling at the first game of the season. You just won, you know, maybe you got to work some kinks out. No, we didn't have time for that. And Peter didn't have time for that. And I, I was on board with him and I thought, you know what? The, he, he, I, no one had to say a word because he hit the nail on the head um, that this was the right time. And this was the right tone and the right message uh, that need we needed at that particular moment after coming off a long preseason um, where we traveled to South America and we stayed, uh, stayed down there for quite some time. And, and this, this is what the team needed at that moment. And, and again, I, I can't imagine that he hasn't had a hundred of those speeches over the last 10 years with his teams. So you talk about coming in, being the misfits, and um, you started the season off, like you said, so well. Did you have a feeling that you guys could, could be something special, which you wound up uh, being at the end of the season? Um, I, I think that that team thought we were going to be good right in preseason when everybody came because everyone had a chip on their shoulder. 
right? Everyone was kind of cast mm -hmm. away from some, uh, McEwen, Matt McEwen was cast away from somewhere. Henderson was. Miklos came and no one knew who he was. And Mo Johnson had been there and he was at the point of, he, he, I think Mo clearly knew that this was going to be his last year, so he wanted the right guys in. And then Bob Gansler comes in and, and um, is just the, the, the organizer, you know, the guy that put all the pieces together and said, hey, you guys, you know, it, it's funny because Bob Gansler gets credit for putting together one of the best defensive teams I think the league has ever had. I don't know, you know, where we are numerically, but we're, we're up there, I'm sure. Um, we never, we never worked on defending, ever. We never worked on mm. defending. We worked on being organized. Uh, and I think Bob Ganser said, I got Peter and I've got Tony, and I'll let them, their voice is going gonna, is gonna to mean a lot more in the game than my voice is from the sideline. I'll let you get And we talked to Bob about it. But we worked on attacking. I think the one thing this team doesn't get credit for, I believe Chicago was the best attacking team yep. in the league, right? And I think it was yep. L.A. next if I'm not mistaken, the LA Galaxy, and then it was us. We were third in the league in attacking, so it wasn't as if we didn't score goals, but I think what people, what people sort of, uh, I don't want to say misunderstood or maybe read into a little bit too much was the fact that we were so comfortable in one nothing games. One nothing. That was it. The door was locked and it was shut, and that was it. We may as well we could have stopped at that point in most of those games, you know. And that's the way our team felt. Um, I can remember a game at Tampa with uh, what was his name, uh, Mamadou Diallo, right, the big forward from from Tampa Bay, and I, screaming. We were up one nothing in Tampa. We just sat back in Tampa. We they couldn't deal with us on the counter. We had some opportunity. We could have made it three or four nil. We were just a little bit sloppy in front of goal. And I can remember him cursing throughout the game how from being frustrated in a game. And this, he was one of the, the top forwards in the league that year. I don't know who led the league in scoring, but he was, he had to be up there. He was certainly one of the more, more dangerous guys. Um, and, uh, and it stuck out to me that, man, we really do frustrate teams. Like we really do make it hard on teams to, to score goals. And there were moments where we got lucky. You go to the final Stoichkov in the first, I don't know what it's five minutes or so. He's only like, uh, I'm going to guess he's eight. I can still see his eyeballs now. Uh, scary character <laughs> looking at him on that left peg, and he hits the, he hits the crossbar in the, the outside mm -hmm. of the post with a shot, you know. If that goes in, that's a completely different ball game. You know, there were so many moments in that game, but that's the way the season went. When you win a championship, things go your way. And when you're losing, you always feel like every one of those things – goes against you every call every pounce you know I've been I've been unfortunately on that side as well and you're, you go home you scratch your head you're like oh man we kicked the crap out of that team tonight but we lost three nothing you know how the hell did we lose three nothing and um, that stuff happens and it's it's cyclical you see in Kansas City who would have thought last year Kansas City you know that sporting Kansas City would have been in a position they were in with the, with the talent they had Right. I mean, you, you wouldn't have guessed that at the beginning of the season, but sometimes you just get in a rut and, and sometimes on the flip side, you get on a run and you make it all the way through the finals. Well, and we've got Tony Miola on the line with us. You mentioned Miklos and, and he had a great story because he scores the match winner in playing in that game, assuming that that was going to be the last game of his career. That's a heck of a way to go out, but you had a storyline too. That was really powerful. Uh, your father was battling cancer at the time right. in 2000. And I believe you had said that he didn't get to watch any of your games in person that season until the final. Is that right? That's it. Yeah, he, he had been going through chemo. Um, and uh, he, he basically had his last chemo treatment 48 hours before the game. And my cousin in New Jersey, now remember that game was in DC. Yep. And my cousin Pat said, uh, he, he said to my father, I'm coming to pick you up. He, he, he said, I got a bed in the back of my van for you. You can sleep the whole way down. You can do whatever you want. And I didn't, the, the only regret I have, I didn't get to see my father after a game. I saw him in the stands. And then after there was a, there was an auxiliary building outside of RFK. I don't know what you call it, but they had it already set up that, you know, our team would go there after the game, regardless of the result, to see our families. But my dad was too tired. My cousin Pat had to take him home. And this was, this was kind of before the, the, uh, the time where you were, like, texting and FaceTiming and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. you know. So it wasn't like I, I couldn't really 
I couldn't really talk to him, but I got to talk to him that later that night when they got home it was about a four hour drive. And, um, he was just, he was just drained, but it just, just to know that he was in the stadium. I didn't know he was in the stadium until after the game, until, um, one of my kids came down on the field and said, Oh, pop pops up there. You know, I was like, Whoa, my father's in the stadium. You know, I had no idea wow. that he was coming to the game, you know, and I got to wave to him. And I you could tell he was just, as you can imagine, kind of, it was his third round of chemo at the time, and uh, he was just drained. And um, luckily, he's still alive today, so we can still talk about 2000 and and you know how special that was. But uh, but yeah, you, you had the story right. That was his first day out in, in like uh, yeah. four and a half months or something like that. Wow. A lot of kids yeah. play sports. I mean, I know myself included. The role of, of the parent in all of it and the journey that you take to reach, I mean, in your case, the highest level of the game. How important was your dad's role in your career from the youngest ages to even now? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm first generation in the U.S., Ali, so I didn't grow up speaking English. You know, I grew up speaking Italian and, and uh this was my dad's dream. You know, he grew up in Italy and and played in the youth club in Avellino, but, you know, quit really quickly. And as you know, the the sport was so big. And in 82, I was a big Italian national team fan and Dino Zoff was my hero. And I rode around with an Italian flag on my bike all around town for two years, you know, and um, with my, with the only other Italian in town, my, my best friend, Sal Rosamilia, you know, the two of us were the only two Italians in town. Um, and that's kind of how my, my love for the game grew through my dad, through my dad introducing me, my mom and dad really introducing me. They're both, they're both from Italy. I'm, uh, you know, they were both born there, didn't come here until they were in their late teens, um, came two years apart, although they had met in, in Italy, um, and ended up getting married while they were in the U S. Um, you know, so th- this is kind of, you know, when I told my father I was going to play baseball, <laughs> man, you can imagine I was like the enemy at the dinner table. <laughs> what, what's this baseball? You know, now my father, when the Yankees don't win, forget it. I get a phone call, you know, like my father, he can't miss a Yankee game, you know? So, and of course, because my, my boys have played baseball so long, he has a, a, another interest, but, um, yeah, it was the, the, the guy's my hero. You know, I hope I, the, the way I think about my dad now, I hope one day uh, my kids think about me that way. If I could get half of if they could think of me half as much as I think of my father, I think, you know, I've won. Definitely. Um, I, I think it's interesting. You said you haven't watched the, the game backs in all these years. And uh, I already saw it, Carter. I saw what I needed to see. <laughs> Well, not, I mean, you, you still remember Swishkov's eyes, so I've got to think, yeah, it's yeah. in the back of your mind there. Um, but you're not the first person – we've been doing a, a lot of these games, and you're not the first uh, player to say that they haven't watched the game back. Peter this and Kerry said it. they hadn't watched it back Oh, either. really? Yeah. 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 This one for me is, sticks out in particular because a lot of people say this is perhaps the greatest MLS Cup final performance of all time by you 10 saves in the game uh, and many people put it up there with one of the greatest cup final performances of all time um what I want to hear maybe what else sticks out in your memory from the game you talked about Stoichkov's eyes already seeing the whites of them um yeah what what comes to mind about the game itself (laughs) Uh, one of my future teammates, uh, Diego Gutierrez, who was on that Chicago Fire team, I, when I when I see when he first came to the locker room, I'll never forget it. He kind of came in. We were excited because he was he was in his prime at the time, and he was coming to our team, and we needed a left-footed player at that moment and a left-sided player. And the first thing I said, man, how the hell did you miss that shot? I don't know if you remember the free kick that went up <laughs> yeah. in the air, and everyone just kind of stared. And all of a sudden, before we knew it. It bounced, and, and everyone missed it. And then Diego Gutierrez was probably mm-hmm. – he couldn't have been, I don't know, three yards away, maybe even closer, and he pings it off. He said he was trying to roof it in the upper part of the net, and he, he obviously hit it too clean, and it goes off the crossbar. And I think it was at that moment where I remember – I realized, I'm sorry, that this was our day. This was kind of – this was – this mm-hmm. was – we're set up for this today. And the other thing that sticks out to me, no, p- people probably never knew, there's a shot that Stoichkov hits a side volley. Um, first time it ever happened in my career. He hit it so hard, but he hit it right at me, and I grabbed it. I, I grabbed it clean, and he completely ripped the palm of my glove all across my fingers. And I was yelling to the sideline. I'm like, I need new gloves. And they're like, you can't hear anything. They're like, what? I'm like, I need new gloves. I'm screaming at you know, the sideline, and no one's paying attention. And Bo Shani, who was the backup at the time, came running down. He's like, well, what's up? I go, 
look, he ripped my gloves. And he's like, oh, you know, only one guy on the bench understands what's going on. That's the other goalkeeper, you know? So, um, and uh, I remember, I remember that. And then I remember the six minutes. I remember the, the, yeah. the six minutes going up. And at that time, I don't know that I've ever seen six minutes of extra time of stoppage time in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, Whoa, six minutes. And, and I talked to Paul Tamarino after that. And, and he, he said to me, he was the referee that game. And he said to me, that was the first time he had ever seen six minutes as well. And how they kind of came to this was odd. Um, and, and one other thing sticks out. I mentioned Paul Tamarino. He, he says all the time, I tell, I say he's the best referee ever we've had in the league. And he, every time I say that to him, he says, that's because I didn't throw you out in the final. And if it were today, I probably would have been close to getting thrown out. There was a ball that went out of bounds, and Ante Razov was on my left side, and Ante Razov was, was trying to keep it in play and then trying to fool the referee a little bit, and I just took a swipe at him. I mean, I literally took him out. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, had Paul Tamburino had, had a moment in that game where he said, I don't like what's going on. Luckily, it was a clean game. Um, a cleaner game, if you will, and, and uh, it wasn't heated up in that way, uh, but it could have been a whole different story at that point. Yeah, Peter, and, and people should watch it because Peter talks about that, and he talks about how back in those days, you actually, the players had a relationship with the referee, and yeah. there was a back and forth, and, and he, you know, it was like everybody was kind of working together um, that, that uh, people will want to hear as well. It was a hot day too, Tony, so those you guys protecting that lead for 80 minutes and then you get the six minutes of stoppage time for all those guys running around and that it, it was a lot warmer than it normally would be in, in an October game right yeah no doubt and in DC uh, of all places I remember we played the first half in the sun and we were in the shade in the second half you know we were doing a lot of defending in that shade so <laughs> uh, but again it was a moment where we felt comfortable and, and Bob Gansler pushed all the right buttons and I remember he brought on Uche Okafor who mm-hmm. the year the years uh, unfortunately Uche is not with us anymore but the the years that uh, but prior to me coming in Uche was one of the best defenders in the league one of the best center backs in the league and then when we went to three in the back we had a we had a Brandon Prudeau who was uh, on the left side who was as quiet a professional as you're ever going to play with but but you n- never made a mistake just just didn't make mistakes you just kind of knew wasn't ever you were never going to be in awe of his game and you knew he was never going to make a mistake he he forced coaches to keep him in the game because you knew every single game, this is what you were getting. So you didn't have to worry about that position. Clearly, with Peter on, on in the middle of the field, you knew he was going to organize. And then we had Nick Garcia, who who um, was a rookie that year yeah. and hadn't, hadn't established a reputation of being sort of a hard-nosed guy that's going to always take an extra, you know, leave his foot in a tackle and all of that stuff. And Peter was really molding him, you know, it, Day by day, he was molding him. Play by play, he was molding him. I'm sure if you talk to Nick, he'd say, yeah, Pete never shut the hell up the entire season, you know, and just was in my – but I, I saw it from behind, and I saw this whole thing kind of, uh, you know, developing, and um, it was uh, it, it, it was just – I don't know how to – it's so hard to explain. I, I guess the, the – the, um, everyone's probably watching this last dance, right, with Michael Jordan mm-hmm. and, and how this thing is playing out. You got – okay, everyone knows the story of, of Michael Jordan didn't make his, his JV team until – he didn't make varsity until he was a junior. You know, kind of – I feel like that story is worn out. But do they know that Scottie Pippen was a manager, right, in college when he started? Mm-hmm. Do they know yeah. what was it, John Kerr – or some Steve Kerr who uh, didn't have – had one offer – to play college basketball like and uh Dennis Rodman I mean his forget the 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 sort of post pro Dennis Rodman like kid didn't even want to play in high school played at a small college so my point is that it was just a group of guys that were put together and the 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 sum of the parts was so great and and Bob Ganser has to get credit for all of it because he realized we didn't have all the superstars we haven't even we haven't even mentioned Precky like Precky was just – Precky may be, for me, one of the top ten players ever in Major League Soccer. You tell me someone mm-hmm. that, that dices you up. We look at Vela now, right, and Vela should get all the credit that he does. For me, Precky was equally as dangerous getting, getting around mm-hmm. the box. And, and I think what Bob Ganser did was took all the pressure off of Precky and said, here's Kerry Zavagnin and Matt McEwen behind you. You do whatever you want to do. 
you don't have to defend if you don't want to. You don't because these guys are going to do all the work, and we're going to couple it with with Chris Klein on that right side, and we know the work that he's going to do, right? And and you know, look at that group, and and the other amazing thing was we we used the same lineup. I felt like every single game, you don't see that all the time. I mean, I felt like that lineup never changed and I almost felt bad for the substitutes because you're like, they're still working their ass off all week and they just can't break into the lineup. You know, they just can't get in. I think that was kind of Bob's MO that year. Yeah. Peter talked a lot about during, during this broadcast, we're going to do about that consistency and why that mattered in terms of the organization you guys had. I'll tell you what, we could talk about this for, for a long time, uh, but I will direct everybody, and, and we'll send you a link, Tony, so you can go back awesome. and watch. And, and Kerry and and, uh, and Peter really talked a lot about – I mean, you were the star. Like I said, you were the star of that show. No, there. I don't know, but I appreciate no, there's that. There's no mistake in it. No, no one that watches that. Sure. You can be modest, but the rest of us watch it, and we, we saw it. So, um, And I think it is something that's important for sport. I'm going to say this to you, Sporting Kansas City fans, if you don't really know or remember about it, because there's been so much phenomenal goal play, goalkeeping play from this organization. And we talk about Jimmy Nielsen and the records he set and, and now Tim Mealy and the records they set, and rightfully so because they're tremendous goalkeepers. You don't know about the history of the goalkeeping in Kansas City if you don't see this performance from the guy that was the MLS MVP that season, by the way, as well. So go watch it Saturday, 7 o'clock, and then again at 9 o'clock. If you miss it at 7, you can watch it at 9 o'clock on Fox Sports Kansas City. And, uh, and Tony, we really appreciate the time, man. It's great to see you. I'm glad you're healthy. And, uh, and hopefully we can do this again with you uh, sometime real soon. You got to love you guys. Thanks, and uh, we'll catch up, hopefully, in Kansas City one day. There you go. That's uh, Tony Miola, the man who, who, who brought that first MLS Cup to, uh, to Kansas City, and we're going to watch it on Saturday night. Back after this to wrap up the Sporting Kansas City show, right after this. And we're back to wrap things up on another edition of the Sporting Kansas City show. Napier Katie, Ali Trost, and Carter Augustine are thanks to Tony Miola for joining us on the show and boy it was cool to hear him guys light up and how much he can remember 20 yeah. years later from that game especially considering the fact he's never gone back to watch it again that's what's been blowing my mind and talking to a lot of these players is that one carter like you had mentioned it, this seems to be a common theme throughout major league soccer at least with sporting kansas city formerly you know wizards players uh that they don't watch these big games or like they lived it in the moment they're like yeah that's, that's about it but they still remember every single like detail from the game that was really impressive yeah that was wild and like we talked about i mean this is one of the greatest cup final performances in american history and he hasn't gone through and watched it but um he didn't even mention any of his saves i don't think he talked or he talked about the one that broke his glove yeah. but then mm-hmm. um he, he talked more about the the two that crashed off the crossbar so he still he still remembers that as well um that yeah that was really cool yeah, yeah and, and that- go ahead go ahead Allie love too is him talking about uh the connection he had with Burmese and the way that they led that defense that they didn't even practice really like in you know during the week defending like they were just kind of dependent on Miola (laughs) and Burmese really just organizing and leading uh defensively and then how that you know trickled up the field as well so just really cool to hear the the championship you know team and, and looking back on a season where you were so successful and it sounds like they had that championship mentality from the start. And he talked about all the one nils that they had. And you see over the history of soccer, a, a team that can close out one nils, it, uh, they're usually so good and, and are able to, to reach that championship level. So that was, that was really cool to hear as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to fight so hard the urge to mention Jose Mourinho. Cause I'm just, you know, I don't like to, but he, but he could get, he could grind out a one nil and won a lot of yeah. championships that way. Um, I, I'm going to give a plug again for those of you that, uh, that want to watch this. I think that there's been a lot of positive feedback from the player commentaries that we've done. From Matt Beasler to Jimmy Nielsen to Benny Failhaber to Jacob Peterson and Tim Melia, Graham Zussi, all the guys we've done these games with, they've all brought something to the table and they've all been fun. So it's probably not fair to sit there and, and, and pick a favorite. But my gosh – you guys are going to want to hear from Peter and Kerry on this. They, look, they're not just players, they're coaches. They come at it from 20 years now, too, of, of perspective. And, and we really got into the things that Peter Vermees 
learned about team building, championship character, and all of that through winning that championship and being a part of that team that, that express themselves in the, the way he runs the club now. Very different styles to play, by the way. The way they played back in 2000 versus the way that sporting plays now and the systems are different. But the idea of what it means to build a team and having the right guys for the right positions and maybe not necessarily having that one big star and everybody else built around him, um, it's in the kind of leadership qualities he looks for. Those are great. They tell some funny stories. I asked Peter about, um, you know, watching the Jordan documentary, which is what the last dance was, was really the Jordan story. Um, and the way he would test, his, test other players. Do you have what it takes to be a champion? And I asked Peter about that. He tells a really funny story about guys slapping each other on the butt and congratulating each other for good practices after uh, the first week of practice. You'll want to hear that story from Peter as well. It's just, it's a lot of fun. So, so make sure uh, you check that out because it's going to be fun. Other thing I want to say, guys, before we wrap up, we're taping this right before Der Klassiker uh, between Dortmund and Bayern Munich. But uh, the three of us, along with Connell McCourt, did a little Bundesliga preview show. I'm assuming we're going to do another one later this week that you'll be able to find on social media channels. Uh, I am loving the fact that we have some good midweek games now, too. We had the last two weekends to look forward to. Now we get some midweek games as well. Um, I think the Bundesliga is going to be fun again this week. It made the return to work after a long weekend a little easier knowing that you could have a huge game on, you know, to look forward to. So I'm pumped for this. I'm really hoping. I know that it hasn't really been the case in the last couple of years, um, but I'm really hoping someone can dethrone Bayern. I know, Carter, you're, uh, you might not <laughs> think that's going to be – I mean, it's going to be fun to watch, and we're taping this after, but we already know Bayern's going to win today. Um, I, I, I'm pretty confident in that. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. Gio Reyna on the bench, ho hopefully, he, hopefully he gets in. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm with you. Hopefully someone can dethrone Bayern, and today would be the day that it would uh, need to happen this year. Well, if Dortmund ends up winning, we are going to light Carter up when we do the Bundesliga show at the end of the week. That's for sure. Well, for Tony Miola, for Ali Trost, Carter Augustine, this is Nate Bucati saying thanks for watching or listening to the Sporting Kansas City show, and we'll see you again next week.